say a big welcome to you and explain that uh, our Saviour Lutheran Church is currently without a pastor and so we are, we are being blessed by our, um, by our lay people. So our service this morning will be led by uh, our lay people and I, I want to say thank you very much for, for all of them to contribute this morning. We are actually streaming this from our chapel and I'm looking out to a large and empty auditorium, um, but I hope that you'll be blessed by, uh, by your participation at home. Um, we've got a couple of people over in the music area. I've got uh, Neil and Margaret here who are sharing with me. I've got Julian and, uh, and Fletcher on, on sound and technology. And we know, we know that God is with us. So um, we are going to, we're going to commence our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and we're going to go straight to our first song. Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. <laughs>
Almighty God, look in mercy on your family. By your great goodness, guide and protect us forever in body and soul. We ask this through your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please join me now in our opening words, which are taken from Psalm 130. Your words are the heavy set type. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. With the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. With the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, yes, more than watchmen wait for the morning. With the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. With the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Amen. Let us confess together the darkness in our lives. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we are sinful and we have sinned against you in many ways, in our thoughts and in our words, in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. Have mercy and forgive us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit Help us to obey you, keep us from all evil, and bring us to eternal life. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God has had mercy on us. He loves us and has given his Son to die for us. So, by the authority which God has given to his church, all our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with us all. Amen. We sing, Change My Heart, O God. Mrs. Stelzer. I'm sitting in my living room. It's a bit fun actually. 
trying to give you a children's address from home and I guess you're probably watching it at home too. So let's see how we go today. Today we're talking about Jesus and his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were really good friends and they liked him a lot. And they sent him a message. Your friend Lazarus is really, really sick. Come quickly. But Jesus didn't come. He hung around where he was with his disciples for a couple of days. They couldn't really understand it. And Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'll go and wake him up. And they went, Oh, it's fine. He's just asleep. But Jesus said, I meant our friend Lazarus has died. But don't worry, God's glory is about to be shown. So Jesus went to the town where Mary and Martha lived with Lazarus. And Jesus asked, where have you put him? And they went, well, Jesus, he's already died. We put him in the tomb. He's been there four days. Jesus got really sad. And the Jews said, oh, see how much he loved his friend. And Jesus came to the tomb. They brought him there. And it was a big cave. And Jesus said, take away the stone from the, ta the cave. Lord, said Martha, it's going to smell really bad. But Jesus said, hey, didn't I say if you believed you'd see God's glory? So they took the stone away. Ugh. And Jesus called out in a really loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. He came out all wrapped up in bandages, kind of like a mummy. You know, you've seen those pictures of Egyptian people. His hands and feet were all wrapped up with linen. And he had a cloth even around his head. And Jesus said, unwrap him. Let him go. And lots of people saw what Jesus had done for Lazarus. And they put their faith in him. It's kind of like Jesus likes to do the impossible, you know. He likes to take a situation where everybody knows he's not going to be able to do anything. And he does stuff. And he changes things. Sometimes we look around right now and we think there's so much that's hopeless. And we've got no hope that anything's going to get better. But we know that God is the God of hope. And we say at Redeemer our motto is our hope is in Christ. Because we know if we believe in Jesus that death is not the final answer. God even came up with a way to defeat death and everybody knew that was impossible. But God specializes in doing the impossible. So let's hang on to our hope. We know that God can achieve the impossible and let's keep believing that he can do that. Have a great week, guys. The first reading this morning is uh, from the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Reading from, verse, oh, reading from chapter 37 and from the first verse. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out of the dark spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath, 
from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Today's Gospel is recorded in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, reading from the first verse. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother, brother Lazarus was now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death, no, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was, at, was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know even that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. 
The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could he not who could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in the strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Lord Jesus, the resurrection and the life, thank you for overcoming death. May we believe in you and live forever. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. We join together now in singing, Because We Bear Your Name.
close relationship that Jesus had with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus is seriously ill, so his sisters send a message to Jesus, counting on their relationship with Jesus to bring the miracle worker to their aid. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Have you ever sent a message to Jesus like that? You've known the Lord for some time and you've developed a close relationship. You know Jesus loves you and you've had experiences in the past that tell you he will be faithful to you in the future. Then something awful happens and there's lots of awful things happening at the moment. COVID-19 lockdown restrictions threaten job losses. An elderly relative gets sick. Friends are stuck on a cruise ship. I'm sure you have your own list of adversities that have turned your world upside down, either now or in the past. Many of us are in the middle of one now. During these times, we may send a message to Jesus. We may add to our prayers the reminder to Jesus that I know you love me, so please come quickly. Can you identify with how Mary and Martha must have felt after sending that message, only to get no reply day after day? I don't think it's too hard to put ourselves in their place. There are times we pray sincere, heartfelt prayers to Jesus, knowing he loves us, knowing he's aware of what's going on, only to be answered with silence. You pray, nothing changes. How would we react to Jesus' response to receiving the message? Jesus said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. At first we might think, oh good, everything's going to turn out just fine. But then we discover, as Mary and Martha did, that it doesn't turn out just fine, at least from our perspective. In fact, it turns out very much to the worse. You lose your job. Your elderly relative goes into the ICU. Cruise ships are night entry to port. Lazarus dies. Then we're left alone with our thoughts and agonising questions. Is Jesus out of touch? Didn't he know the situation was serious? How does this add one iota to God's glory? Maybe God doesn't love me after all. We find ourselves alone with our tears. It may be good at this point to let you in on how John's using this story. John in his Gospel account has a keen interest in showing us how Jesus, as the Son of God, reveals the Father and provides eternal life. This story of Lazarus is John's last stop in a series of miraculous stories that serve as signs for his readers. There are seven signs in all, and each serves in filling out Jesus' self-revelation. The seven signs, the first one, changing water into wine at Cana, then healing the royal official's son in Capernaum, healing the paralytic at Bethesda, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man blind from birth, and now the raising of Lazarus. Each sign reveals a little more of who Jesus is and what his mission is in the world. As we encounter these signs in John's Gospel, we come to know who Jesus is and who the Father is. In this way, we're called to grow in our faith and once again place our trust in him. John uses the story of Jesus raising Lazarus as the seventh and final sign that ultimately culminates in the religious authorities crucifying him. So John paradoxically tells the story of Jesus bringing Lazarus to life, which will end up leading to Jesus' death. There's more going on in this story than Jesus just restoring one man to his family. When Jesus hears Lazarus is sick, we're reminded that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. The next verse surprises us as Jesus intentionally decides to wait for two more days. 
Our trust in the Father's love for us is often challenged when we feel he has left us waiting and weeping. But it is always his love that governs his actions. When Jesus decides to go back to Judea, the disciples try to discourage him for fear of the religious authorities. But Jesus knows he is walking in the light of the Father's will and he will not be deterred. He tells them Lazarus has fallen asleep. His disciples think he's talking about natural sleep, but Jesus tells them plainly that Lazarus has died. When Jesus finally arrives, he finds that Lazarus has been dead four days. Ancient Jewish belief held that the spirit of a dead person would hover around the body for three days. During that time, it's still possible for resuscitation. After four days, all hope is lost. Jesus arrives and finds Lazarus four days dead and beyond help. We may find ourselves identifying with Lazarus' state in our own lives. Job losses, broken relationships, moral failures, humiliating circumstances and other experiences can leave us feeling four days dead, beyond all hope. Have you ever been there? It's hard to get up in the morning when you feel four days dead. Maybe you feel you have failed just one time too many and now are beyond the reach of God's mercy and forgiveness. Perhaps you've shut down and tuned out because you don't have anything left in you. You're all done. You gave it your best, but at the end of the day, you're four days dead and flat on your back. John is telling us that Jesus can show up late and work a miracle even when we're four days dead. Martha meets Jesus on his arrival and she's struggling with her belief in Jesus. Jesus wants to move her beyond placing her comfort in theological presuppositions to placing her comfort and trust in him by telling her, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice how Martha learns a little more about Jesus through this ideal, ordeal. Jesus has moved her further in her relationship with him to where she doesn't find hope in a far distant day of the resurrection on the last day, but instead has found hope in the present, knowing that Jesus is the resurrection and the life who is present with her today. She makes a profound statement of faith when she says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. It's after she comes to this depth of knowing Jesus that she runs off to tell her sister Mary. The more we come to know Jesus for who he is, the more we will want to tell others. Also, the better we see Jesus, the better our witness of him will be. Martha doesn't tell Mary she needs to find Jesus. What does Mary need to hear? She needs to hear that Jesus is here and calling for her. Perhaps you need to hear that today. If you're feeling four days dead or buried under a weight of grief, the Lord is not waiting for you to track him down. He's already here and he's calling for you. Have you ever experienced the lift of hearing that someone is calling for you? It feels good to be wanted and searched out. How many in our broken world would respond as Mary did if they heard that Jesus was calling for them? Mary responds by immediately going to him. In the interchange between Mary and Jesus, we witness Jesus being deeply moved in spirit. This deep agony is summed up in the two simple words, Jesus wept. Why was Jesus so sorrowful? It may seem odd that he would mourn over a dead man that he was about to raise to life. But taking John's aim of revealing the nature of Jesus into account, I think we can see that Jesus' tears stream from his solidarity with humanity. Jesus didn't come to be distant and detached from us. He enters our suffering. The tears he cries are our tears. This story reminds us that Jesus is with us. The Father is with us.
the Spirit is with us to comfort and protect us. We do not weep alone. When we mourn and weep, we're expressing a love for something lost. We're saying that what has happened is wrong and it shouldn't be. Grieving death is affirming life. Then surely the one who is life would be the one who grieves the most deeply. In fact, Jesus grieves deeply enough to get under all that is lost, to plunge to the utter depths of all death and decay, so that he can lift it up in his resurrection life. Jesus moved beyond the tears to the tomb. Unlike the Jews who thought they were going with Mary to the tomb to mourn, Jesus goes to the tomb to restore. John gives us a picture of the events that will take place after this story. Jesus will again go to the tomb, but it will be his own. On Easter, he wipes away every tear. John records Jesus raising Lazarus as a sign of Easter morning when Jesus will be resurrected. Did you catch how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? He calls him, Lazarus, come out. Jesus is the word from the Father that calls us to new life in him. Just as he called for Mary and just as he called forth Lazarus, Jesus is still calling today. He's calling to you right now. Can you hear him? Lazarus, even four days dead, was able to hear his name from the lips of Jesus and responds by coming out of the tomb. As Lazarus comes from the tomb, still in burial clothes, Jesus tells the onlookers to take off the grave clothes and let him go. As we see that our brothers and sisters are alive in Christ, we can then participate in setting them free from their grave clothes into this new reality. Lazarus had indeed been raised from the dead, but remaining in grave clothes would prevent him from living it out. As we approach Holy Week and the upcoming Easter celebration, may we embrace the reality that Jesus, in his death and resurrection, has set us free to life. As we live in our broken world, we can join Jesus in his tears for his lost creation. We can share the good news that Jesus has come and he is calling us out to himself. May we go tell others who are still waiting and weeping. Amen. And now we'll see you next song.
ask God to bless the time, the talents, and the possessions that we give in service to God. Thank you, eternal God, for giving us new life. Help us to live according to your spirit and willingly serve you and our fellow human beings with all that we are and all that we have. Amen. Let us now declare together the faith we hold in common with all Christians in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us continue using the words that our Lord himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer, let us take a few moments to quieten our, our lives and our hearts and our minds. In times of restraint and physical distancing, when the body of Christ cannot meet in one place, we gather through the Holy Spirit in our many different places, house, apartment, room, and call out to you. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Give courage and wisdom to national governments and local authorities to enforce public health regulations for the welfare of all and increase efforts to stop the spread of the virus that affects every human being. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Breathe a spirit of love and self-discipline into your church that it continually promote and protect regulations and restrictions for the well-being of all. Strengthen our witness to embody examples of compassionate self-restraint. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. God, have mercy. Heal the sick. Strengthen the elderly and vulnerable. Protect all from the spread of COVID-19. Hear our, our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. God, have mercy. Support and protect all healthcare workers and all who serve the sick and those at high risk of infection. We remember in particular refugees and those serving them today. Reinforce all agencies that support public health. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. God, have mercy. Comfort and uplift those who are alone, isolated, 
oppressed by solitude and anxiety. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. God, have mercy on the whole human family and on your creation. Especially hear our specific prayers that we are now spoken out loud or in the silence of our hearts. We think of those in our own congregation who are suffering at this time, and we name those we love in our hearts. Hear our cry, O oh God, listen to our prayer. Fill each and every heart with that trust in your grace that frees us and binds us together in communion in the one body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear us, O God. Listen to our prayer. Send your Holy Spirit. Renew your church in its prayer and in solidarity with all its neighbours. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Remember in your mercy all those who have died and will die today. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Trusting in your great compassion and unconditional promise always to be with us, we pray. Amen. And as we come to the end of this time together, hear a blessing from our God. Go in peace. God, who raised Christ from death, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. The final song that we sing is Nothing But the Blood. We pray that you have been blessed today by joining with us and share morning tea and smile at the birds. <laughs>